there are thousands of tribes that come with diverse traditions and customs. And many of these tribes we don't even know of exist. Funny enough, some of us might have had close encounters with any of these non-aggressive tribes. And I promise you, they're pretty fascinating if you get to know more about their customs and traditions, and mostly importantly, how they came about. From the extremely secluded Sentinelese tribe to the smallest settlements unknown to many, here are 20 scariest tribes you don't want to meet. Number 20, Pacific Islanders. If you're a fan of evolution, then you might want to stick around longer. The DNA of contemporary Melanesians, who are people who live in a region of the South Pacific Northeast of Australia, apparently contains traces of an unidentified extinct human species. New genetic modeling suggests that the species is not Neanderthal nor Denisovan, two extinct species that are represented in the fossil record, but rather a third, undiscovered human relative that has evaded archaeologists up to this point. And according to the University of Texas statistical geneticist Ryan Bolander, they are either overlooking a population or misinterpreting the relationships. <laughs> Bolander and his team have been examining how much extinct hominid DNA is still present in modern humans. They claim to have discovered inconsistencies in earlier assessments that indicate human interbreeding with Neanderthals and Denisovans isn't the complete picture. Our earliest ancestors are considered to have left Africa between 100,000 and 60,000 years ago and first encountered other hominid species on the Eurasian mainland. Since Europeans and Asians still have distinct genetic variations of Neanderthal DNA in their own genomes, this interaction has left a lasting impact on our species. Before we begin, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. North Sentinelese. This tribe gained notoriety after it was claimed that a U.S. citizen was killed by a protected tribe while attempting to enter a forbidden North Sentinel Island. His passing sparked a discussion about the recluse tribe, about which not much is known. Any attempts by the outside world to contact the Sentinelese are reportedly met with tremendous hostility. A National Geographic director who was attempting to make a documentary on the tribe in 1974 was reportedly attacked by them. The Sentinelese reportedly shot arrows at an Indian aircraft that was flying over the island during the 2004 tsunami to protest unwelcome attempts to keep an eye on them. There were 8,000 people living there at the time the British made their first attempts to colonize the archipelago and the nearby islands in the 1800s, although there is currently no definitive way to determine their exact population size. It's estimated that they have a population of between 50 and 150. Due to their isolation, the tribe has very little immunity to diseases brought in from the outside world. This has raised worries that any virus exposure from contact with the outside world could cause the entire tribe to be wiped out and even go extinct. Number 18. The Patak. One of Palawan's indigenous groups is the Patak. They have lived in a number of river valleys along the 50 kilometers of coastline northeast of what is now Puerto Presenza, city since prehistoric times. They are regarded as descended from Negritos. Short stature, dark skin, and curly hair are the physical characteristics that gave these people their distinctive names. Their primary sources of income come from swidden farming, hunting, and gathering natural resources products, especially honey, rattan poles, and almasica resin. The only sources of food for them were the creeks, rivers, and occasionally the sea. They were very nimble individuals. They are not motivated to cultivate permanent land areas for crop production for this main reason. Only cassava, banana, sweet potato, ube, gabi, and coconuts are typically planted. The Batak's religion is still based on the nature spirits that they think live in the large rocks and trees. When their Balin invokes the spirits, they have the ability to recover from Rasiri's illness. A long-standing custom is followed, and their system of political governance is headed by Masiri Campo, chosen by the overall Masiri Campo from the Tagbauna. At the turn of the century, there were thought to be 1,000 Batak people. However, the 1990 census counted only 450 of them. There are currently eight communities where they live. Number 17. Suri Tribe 
The Suri is an agro-pastoral people who live in parts of South Sudan's neighboring South Sudan and Ethiopia's West Omo Zone of the Southern Nations, Nationalities, and Peoples Region SNNPR. In the southwest of Ethiopia, there are about 34,000 Suri people. They go by the name Suri are divided into two factions, Tirmaga and Chai. A third group, the Bale or Balesi or Kachipo, also live in part of the Republic of South Sudan and frequently cross the border to pursue their interests due to commerce, intermarriage, or the sporadic hunt for greener pastures during the dry season, speak a slightly different language. In 1897, troops from Imperial Ethiopia occupied the Suri region. After that, the area became part of Ethiopia, officially, and was frequently the target of cattle raids by Highlanders and Imperial troops stationed in the brand new villages. Their society once had a fairly autonomous political structure led by the elders of the ruling age grade and a few ritual chiefs or priests, known as Komoru among the mercy, though it's now more integrated into national Ethiopian administrative structures and is more under the control of the state. The supreme sky deity among the Suri people is known by the name Tumu. The Komoru serves as a liaison between people and Tumu, the sky god who is responsible for rain and fertility. But Suri does not hold any form of public Tumu related religious rites. Clan line ancestors are acknowledged to possess special abilities and to have an impact on the well being and future of current individuals. 200 to 300 Suri people have converted to evangelical Christianity in the previous 15 years, mostly in the town of Kibish, and among those who have left the region to pursue higher education. Number 16 The Dasala Tribe. Although they are known as the Karubu Indians, this tribe prefers to refer to themselves as the Dasala. They are native speakers of a Pena language that is connected to the Matis and Mayaruna Matsis, Indians' North Pano dialects. They do not, however, tattoo their faces like other tribes who reside in the Javari River Valley, such as the Matis, Mayaruna Matsis, and the Marubos. Their distinctive hairdo, which is precisely cropped in the back and longer in the front, makes them easy to identify. The majority of the Karubos has not yet been in contact with humans, and what little we do know about them comes from interactions with the tiny population that resides close to the Funai outpost at the junction of the Itui and Etakwai rivers in the Brazilian Javari River Valley. The alleged leader of this organization is a woman going by the name of Maya who can be seen in some of the pictures up top. The Karobu typically hunt using blowguns rather than bows and arrows. Shotgun hunting is typically not as popular among blowgun hunters as it is among bow and arrow hunters. This is most likely related to the higher success rate of hunting with blowguns and the expensive cost of shotgun rounds. The Karubus currently have few shotguns and mainly hunt with blowguns. They are mostly hunters and gatherers, but they also engage in horticulture and grow products that are native to the Amazon like maize, plantains, and manioc. Number 15. Mashko Piro. The Peruvian government is attempting to contact one of the last uncontacted Amazonian tribes after they used a bow and arrow to shoot and kill two men in the chest. The Mashko Piro clan, commonly known as the Kujareño people, has been isolated from the outside world for 600 years, living in a jungle in Peru near the Brazilian border. But recently, the rarely seen indigenous group has emerged from the jungle to invade settlements in search of food, tools, and hunting gear because they are endangered by modern forestry, drug cartels, and tourism. Leonardo Perez, 20, was slain in May when tribe members who wanted his equipment shot him with an arrow. Chaco Flores, a Matsagenka Indian and local guide, were killed by the tribe in 2011. Chaco had built a solid rapport with the tribe over the course of 20 years by providing them with machetes, pots, and pans. He attempted to convince them to settle down and put an end to their nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle but it's thought that he was murdered by an arrow to the heart. The Mashko Piro people's isolation from industrialized culture is slowly being peeled back by their growing interactions with other indigenous populations. The tribe's members have been observed a record 100 times this year alone. According to Patricia Balbuena, the deputy minister of culture in Peru, some people have even moved out of the forest and are now living among the nearby Yain Indians, who also speak a similar language. Number 14. 
Ankutsu tribe. The Ankutsu currently live in a tiny area of woodland. Despite being acknowledged and legally defined by the Brazilian government, it is bordered by enormous soy and cattle ranches. These have taken the place of Rodonia's once vast rainforests which were inhabited by numerous tribes. They share two modest straw-baled malocas, communal homes, within the same neighborhood. They are skilled hunters who prize wild pigs, agoutis, and tapir. They also tend tiny gardens where they grow corn and manioc. Additionally, they harvest wild fruits and occasionally fish in creeks for smallmouth bass. Three members make up the tiny Amazonian tribe known as the Ankunsu. They reside in the western Brazilian state of Rondonia and are the last known members of their people. The Ankunsu will go extinct in a few decades and our globe will have lost a distinctive people, language, and culture. Wooden flutes made by the Ankunsu are utilized in dances and rituals. They have anklets and armbands made of palm fiber. The Ankunsu cut the pesticide containers left as garbage by the ranchers to make colorful plastic necklaces in their place of the shell necklaces. For festivities, they use uricum and natto dye to paint their bodies. Number 13. Kazakh Eagle Hunters Tribe when presented as part of the BBC's Human Planet series in 2011, footage of Kazakh eagle hunters galloping through the immense landscape of Mongolia's Altai Mountains caused audience members to gasp and wonder. The weathered-faced father and son each rode with one arm outstretched and a large blindfolded golden eagle perched on their palms, dressed in animal skins to protect them from the below freezing temperatures. The blindfolds were taken off and the eagles flew down to seek the prey while a fox ran across the plains below. The ultimate test of the eagle handler's prowess. The setting hardly resembled reality, much less something from the 21st century. In fact, using raptors for hunting is barely a modern Kazakh tradition. Genghis Khan was reputedly a fan. And Marco Polo wrote about eagle hunting with Khan's grandson in the 1100s. Cave paintings show falconry techniques from the Bronze Age. The Kazakh eagle hunters who astounded viewers of the Human Planet movie are now welcoming visitors who can learn about their way of life and taken in this falconry prowess. Additionally, contemporary celebrations in Western Mongolia highlight the distinctive bond that exists between hunters and their eagles, as well as conventional horsemanship and other elements of the Kazakh culture. Number 12. Mokin Tribe Three different tribes that live on the Andaman coast of Burma and Thailand are collectively referred to as Mokin. The Mokin of Mergui Archipelago, the Mokin of Phang Nagao Province, and the Urek Lawoi who live from Phuket to South Satun. Their language, culture, and way of life are distinctive and have Austronesian roots. They have a long history of coexisting peacefully with neighbors on the mainland. The Mugui Archipelago, which is located between Burma and the islands off the North Andaman coast of Thailand, has been home to the Mokin for a very long time. The Mokin were maritime nomads who spent most of their time traveling from bay to bay in traditional houseboats known as kabang. Families would unite during the monsoon season and create makeshift settlements on safe beaches. The history of the Mokin is passed down orally from generation to generation through folklore because they do not have a written language. Family bonds are reliable and strong. Additionally, the Mokin language lacks words for private property, which is mirrored in a shared and charitable society. The Mokin are animals who have a deep appreciation for and respect their natural surroundings and resources. The Mokin people were subsistence hunters and gatherers in the past, exchanging fish, sea cucumbers, and shells for rice and other essentials. Over 80 plant species are used by them for sustenance, 28 for medicine, and 105 for shelter, handicrafts, and other uses. Number 11. Simbu Tribe in Papua New Guinea's highlands region is the province of Chimbu, which is also sometimes written as Simbu. The tribes of Chimbu wear enormous headdresses fashioned of various birds, some of whose feathers measure one meter in length. The people also enjoy dressing up their bodies in order to make them shine, stay warm, and occasionally to terrify their numerous foes. Pig fat 
Kina shells and paint produced from plant oil, clay, and mud are a few of the decorations used. They also wear bilas, which are body decorations worn to ward off enemies. The initiation and marriage ceremonies are the most significant among the many ceremonies performed by the Chimbu people within their community. Families are brought together at these events and bonds among tribe members are strengthened. Both rites entail the trading or killing of pigs, which are prized possessions among the Chimbu tribes. Number 10. Korowai Tribe In Papua New Guinea, there is a fascinating tribe known as the Korowai Tribe. There had never been any prior reported contact between them and the West prior to the 1970s. The group might not even have known that anyone else existed, save itself, according to scientists. What you need to know about the Korowai Tribe is provided below. The capacity of the remote and primitive tribe to build enormous tree houses that power 140 feet above the jungle is one of their most amazing architectural feats. The tree house was built and set up on stilts to provide protection from neighboring settlements. Only wooden ladders that have been positioned up against the stilts to reach the top can be used to enter these simple buildings. It wasn't until 1974 when a team of western scientists went on an excursion to the region that outsiders first encountered this person. Basic observations were taken and some terms and regional practices such as making fire were written down. Many core white people still hold on to the notion that strangers are possessed by demons and evil spirits. Number 9. Mudmen Tribe If you're wondering why these people are known as mudmen, it's because they frequently wear mud masks. The Asaro Mudmen Tribe inhabits the eastern section of Papua New Guinea. Their traditional masks include strange patterns that are intended to frighten away foes. A few examples of designs are horns, sideways lips, long eyebrows that touch the ear tips, and extended ears. The masks that are further embellished with shells and pig's teeth, creating truly frightening masks. According to Asaro tradition, a prior loss that forced the tribesmen to escape to the river Asaro necessitated the use of masks. When their opponents tried to crawl out of the river, the white muck they were covered in terrified them away. Their adversaries fled to their villages under the impression that ghosts from the river had returned to flight them. The Asaro decided to create mud masks as a defense against more attacks as a result. There are actually many different explanations for how they got to be known as the Mudmen, but we felt that this one was more accurate and fascinating. Number 8. Chukchi People in the far northeastern part of Siberia, which is inhabited by Russia, there are a number of tiny, historic Paleo-Siberian tribes. An ancient Arctic people, the Chukchi, are mostly located on the Chukchi Peninsula in Chukota. The northern portions of the Kamchata Peninsula and the southern tip of the Chukchi Peninsula are also home to the Koryak. Sakhalin Island and the Armour River Valley are home to the Nivk people. According to some researchers, the Koryaks and the Chukchi of extreme northern Siberia, as well as maybe some native Alaskan groups, are linked to the Nivsks. Those Chukchi, who reside in the Chukchi Peninsula's interior, historically been reindeer herders and hunters, while those who reside near the coasts of the Arctic Ocean, Chukchi Sea and Bering Sea, have typically engaged in the pursuit of marine mammals like seals, whales, walruses, and sea lions. The Chukchi refer to themselves as Ligora Vedlat, which is Chukchi for true people. Russia undertook a number of forceful military operations against the Chukchi in 1729. The Russian authorities concluded in the 1760s that it would be too expensive in terms of both money and troops to expel the Chukchi. The Chukchi were ordered to stop attacking Russian settlements and to begin paying the annual fee that native Siberians paid in furs before the war was declared over. Group settlements where their work and play were controlled by government. Shikota evolved to become a mine and gulag region. Millions of Soviet civilians were detained throughout the 1930s, necessitating the need for remote locations to construct prison camps. The Chukchi were frequently the targets of Russian jokes about ethnic stereotypes later in the Soviet era. Approximately 15,000 Chukchi people currently reside in the Russian Federation. The Chukchi Autonomous District, located in the Magadan region and the country's easternmost point, is home to the majority of the Chukchi. Number 7. The Night Marcher since ancient times, the telling of eerie ghost stories has been a popular form of entertainment and a significant cultural link in Hawaii. Old structures, steep valleys, holy cemeteries, historic temple sites called Hayao, wooden regions, beaches, and lava fields all have been the scene of recorded hauntings or ghostly apparitions. 
Hawaii's connection to the past is ever-present thanks to the state's extensive sacred sites and rich mythological and folklore heritage. The vast majority of people who live in Hawaii have either personally experienced a paranormal event or are aware of someone who has. The Night Marchers, or Hawaiipo, are one of the island's most well-known ghost story subjects. The Night Marchers are spectral representations of a group of entities that march purposefully to the rhythm of rudimentary pounding drums. Some claim that they are armed spirit warriors carrying ancient weapons and wearing ornamented helmets and cloaks who are on their way to or from combat. Other legends describe powerful Ali ruler spirits being led to significant locations or to welcome new soldiers to the fray. These wandering spirits can be seeking to retake legitimate land, relive mishandled conflict, or exact revenge on themselves. Some claim that the Night Marchers are meticulously looking for a portal to the afterlife. According to legend, night marchers walk through extremely specific areas and are frequently identified by their held high torches and repeated oils, or chants. These apparitions tend to be most active at night and are claimed to march on particular nights determined by the moon, but there have been a few scattered accounts of marches during the day. Additionally, some local tales claim to have seen enigmatic footsteps in the night marchers' route after they have passed, despite the fact they are said to float a few inches above the earth. What should one do if they come to a night march in progress? Never should the eerie procession be stopped. Witnesses are instructed to crouch low to the ground, act dead, and divert their eyes since legend has it that doing so could portend a terrible fate for the culprit, a friend, or relative. Number 6. Agori Tribe There are numerous hypotheses or stories concerning the Agori's tribe of India including information about their existence, daily routines, and interactions with other people. However, there isn't much in any of those stories that can be considered to be factual. The Agoris claim their ancestry to Baba Kinaram, an ascetic who is said to have lived 150 years and passed away in the second part of the 18th century. Baba Kinaram was similar to the Kapalika ascetics of ancient Kashmir as well as the Kalamukas, with whom there may be a historical relationship. Some people view their practices as being in opposition to traditional Hinduism, as a result of their extremely aromatic rituals and practices of renunciation and tapasya. Many Agori gurus are held in high regard by rural populations and frequently mentioned in works of Indian literature from both the medieval and modern periods. The Agoris claim their ancestry to Baba Kinaram, an ascetic who is said to have lived 150 years. Number 5. The Cargo Cult In 1946, Australian government patrols went into the uncontrolled interior highlands of New Guinea and discovered the natives there engulfed in a tidal surge of religious fervor. The coming of the whites was an indication that the end of the world was near, according to a prophecy. The natives then butchered every single one of their pigs, which served as both main source of food and a representation of social position and ritual primacy in their culture. They sacrificed these precious animals because they believed that great pigs would appear from the sky after three days of darkness. To get through until the great pigs arrived, the population needed to stockpile food, firewood, and other needs. Mock wireless antennae made of bamboo and rope had been built to get the news of the new millennium in advance. Many people thought that after the great event, their black skins would return white. Cargo cults led by prophets who claimed to have received a fresh revelation first surfaced in the late 19th century, gained popularity during the Papuan Viala Madness in 1919 and began to expand in great numbers starting in the 1930s, especially in remote and underdeveloped places. Cargo cults were replaced by more secular movements in expanding communities. Number 4. The San Bushman Tribes the San have resided in southern Africa for at least 20,000 years, making them the region's oldest residents. The name San is frequently used to describe a varied group of hunter-gatherers with linguistic and historical ties to southern Africa. The term Bushman was also used to refer to the San, but it has since been dropped since it's offensive. There are several different San groups that go by the titles Bushman, San, and Baswara. They do not have a single name for themselves. The word Bushman is derived from the Dutch word Bossiesman, which denoted an outlaw or bandit. During their protracted conflict with the colonists, this name was given to the San. The San regarded this as a proud and revered 
nod to their valiant struggle against tyranny and colonialism. The labels Bushmen or San is now widely accepted. The San share the sad histories of poverty, social rejection, loss of cultural identity, and violation of their rights as a community with the original inhabitants of other nations. However, the San have also drawn interest from anthropologists and the media due to their superior hunting, extensive native knowledge of southern Africa's flora and wildlife, and rich cultural traditions. The San people speak a variety of dialects of a family of languages, distinguished by distinctive clicks in the pronunciation, which are represented in writing by symbols like or slash. Small mobile groups of up to 25 men, women, and children make up San communities. Groups come together at specific times of the year for social gatherings, the exchange of gifts and news, and marriage plans. Number 3. The Whole Wigman Tribes the Hull Wigmen are a proud tribe from the Hull territory in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. The Hull are a proud people who believe they are descended from one guy by the name of Hull, a skilled farmer who gave them the fertile, rich land they now inhabit in the Hull territory. Because Hull women are viewed as dangerous witches who sap a man's masculinity, young teenage males are kept apart from their moms and sisters. Young lads join the Haroli bachelor cult and live in seclusion in a remote location deep in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. The lads bring themselves to the village with their full head of hair ready to be harvested and transformed into a wigman after a period of 18 months to 3 years, during which they ritually purify themselves and their hair with oils and herbs. They have both ceremonial clothing and ordinary attire. Like most sophisticated societies, a wigman is shown below, dressed normally. His face is hardly painted, and the wig is a lighter color. In Papua New Guinea's town centers, you will most frequently find the holy dressed in this way. Number 2. The Dogon Tribe The imagination is allowed to run wild when visiting the Dogon homeland. For millennia, the Dogon have inhabited the Bandigara Cliffs. They are regarded as one of the remaining groups of people in West Africa to maintain their ancient traditions. They are animist cultivators known for telling old myths, engaging in intricate initiation rites, dancing while wearing magical masks, and performing extremely symbolic rituals. It has been stated and written that current scientists are frequently astounded by their astronomical expertise. We have come here to verify how much of this is accurate for ourselves. They are mostly an agrarian society, and the few craftsmen they have, particularly those who work with metal and leather, have formed distinct classes. The senior male descendant of the common ancestor serves as the ruler of their villages, which are made up of patrilineages, and extended families and lack a centralized structure of governance. Although polygyny is practiced, it's allegedly not very common. More Christians than Muslims make up the Dogon population. Most people follow conventional religion. Number 1. The Himba Tribe The Himba people moved into their first villages in the early 16th century after crossing the Angolan border and settling Kaukolan. Today known as the Kunin region. Because they had not yet broken away from the Herero tribe, the word Himba did not exist at the time. The end of the 19th century saw a relentless bovine outbreak in Namibia. The Herero tribe experienced a severe problem when the majority of their cattle died. The tribe then relocated south and began the chances of surviving. However, some of the group chose to remain and continued the struggle for its survival in their comfortable surroundings. The split between the two tribes materialized right there, and the Himba identity emerged. For them, it's common for the women to carry out daily tasks like milking cows and caring for the kids, while the men go hunting, occasionally disappearing for extended periods of time. The Himba, a polygamous people with a population of over 50,000, marry off their girls to male partners chosen by their fathers once they reach puberty. Most of their cultures have been upheld despite Western influence and agitation. Among these is the man comes first tradition. That's all for today's video, the 20 scariest tribes you don't want to meet. Don't forget to tell us which one amazed you the most in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on the screen right now. See you next time.